Um, Odile's first slide was the perfect setup for our next speaker uh, this morning, Dr. Jennifer Attard from Munster, Munster Technical uh, University, because those 2018 figures on food waste, you will recall, had opposite primary production, three little question marks. Well, those are question marks are a big blank that Jennifer has been engaged in a research piece on food waste in the primary production sector and can hopefully fill those blanks in for us now. Good morning, Jennifer. Good morning, Philip. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much. Um, and thanks to the EPA for inviting me to, to speak today. Um, it, it's fantastic to be uh, to be a part of this event. Um, yes, yeah, so like, uh, so like I said, I'm going to be speaking about primary production, um, food loss and waste. And um, so this was um, a project that was funded by the EPA and um, so it was called the Efficient Food Project. And um, it's a project that we finished just earlier this year. Um, it was led by ourselves at the Circular Bioeconomy Research Group at MTU, um, as well as with our colleagues, uh, Tracy O'Connor and Rosanna Kleeman from UCD. Um, so yeah, so just to clarify primary production, um, primary production is the first part of the food supply chain. It's all of agriculture, aquaculture and fishing. Um, so these are all of the different, uh, so it's basically animal husbandry, horticulture, tillage, aquaculture and, and fishing there. So we, we would have used the interview method for this. It was a one year project. So like Sharon said, initially, all we did was try to um, to try to get an initial picture. There was no research really um, in Ireland on, on food loss and waste and primary production. So, so uh, we, we spent one year trying to figure out where the issues are, if there are issues, um, and, and yeah, creating a database for that. So we created the database on um, the quantities of food loss and waste for all of the different foods that you're seeing here um, by interviewing representatives from um, Chagas, the IFA, BIM, Inland Fisheries Ireland, um, and so on, and obviously the growers and fishers themselves. Um, and um, apart from just having the quantities, we also have associated reasons. So if you take, for example, potatoes, we'd know that there is maybe 7.5% um, food loss and waste there because um, potato some potatoes are unharvestable or um, or maybe 3% due to storage losses. So that's that's just to show you the kind of, the kind of breakdown that we have for all the different foods that you see here. Um, and if you add all the food waste from all of these different foods, that amounts to 70,000 thousand tons so that's the figure that uh, we'll probably be reporting to the to the European Commission and um, however um, although the European Commission definition on food waste works quite well maybe for in the rest of the supply chain it doesn't really work very well for primary production so this number is actually quite uh, misrepresentative because um, the definition um, provided by the European Commission for, for food waste measurement um, is that um, they, they're only looking to, to quantify really what's uh, post-harvest. So they only count post-harvest losses as a waste and everything pre-harvest is, is not going to be um, is not going to be recorded. So um, so what, what are pre-harvest losses if for example a farmer knows he's not going to sell um, you know, a number of his cabbages, he won't bother harvesting them, and therefore, you know, that is a waste, but that won't be recorded. Um, so that's that's obviously a huge, huge amount of waste there. Same with um, an animal husbandry, for example, with livestock. If something, if an animal isn't harvested or slaughtered, um, if it dies on the farm, um, that's not counted as, as a waste, but as a loss. So, um, so all of those kind of pre-harvest um, losses amounts to 120,000, which is bigger again. And um, so our total food loss and waste in Ireland from all of primary production is actually 190,000. So that's fairly significant. And um, even though all we'll be reporting is, is 70,000 at this point. And um, so there's something to think about there in terms of the definition. Um, but moving on from that to a breakdown of the results that we have. Um, so, so essentially this graph shows, we'll start with the red and the red bars. So these show the tonnages of food loss and waste. So I'll be focusing on food loss and waste together and not just food waste, um, because I think I think that's more important. And um, it tells a better picture of what's actually happening. Um, so, so yeah, so the, the red bars show the tonnages of food loss and waste in each sector. So for horticulture, it's fairly obvious that that's um, where the graph shows that it's, yeah, that's where the issues are in Ireland. And um, it's not a huge um, food sector in Ireland, but yet the, it's, um, it's still quite a significant amount of waste. Um, followed by animal husbandry and tillage, aquaculture and fisheries um, don't seem to have any significant problems. Um, but what's more interesting from this graph or more valuable, I suppose, is, um, is the blue 
guidelines that shows the proportion of food waste from each food sector that's being wasted. So um, what that means is if we take animal husbandry, we know that that's the biggest um, food sector in Ireland. About 90% of the food that we looked at is from animal husbandry and still um, the food loss and waste isn't that high. And that's because only 0.5% um, of the food over there is, um, is being wasted. So the sector is already quite efficient. There's not any major issues. Of course, there still are some issues, but um, whether it's because it's such a big sector in Ireland or because um, it, you know that we've gotten really good at it or because it involves animal welfare as well, there's quite strong regulations there. And um, yeah, the, the sector is just, it's quite efficient already. Um, but obviously in contrast, that is the horticulture sector that is quite a small sector um, and yet has most of the food waste that we have is coming from there. So there's 21% of all of our food loss and waste in primary production comes from um, horticulture so I will focus on that a bit more today and um, so I'll leave that for now moving on to tillage which we know isn't really used in Ireland for food but more for feed but we looked at some things like peas in small quantities and um, and barley for um, for malting and um, so there's there's a little bit of waste there but not too bad um, aquaculture has significant problems, it's a very small sector. So even though there's 35% of everything that's produced there is lost or wasted, it doesn't result in being a huge amount of waste because the sector is so small. Um, but the majority of issues there are, for example, um, environmental stresses or production stresses, such as um, things like with farmed salmon. Um, if you know there's too many in a small space or these kinds of things, you end up with a lot of um, disease, illness, infection. Um, same with oyster handling and grading. Um, it's, a combination of environmental and production stresses that just makes some issues really, really bad there. And that leads to 35% of all the food being wasted. And lastly, fisheries. And um, so fisheries, again, is a smaller sector um, than some of the others, but um, but potentially because of the same reasons as animal husbandry, because it involves um, the welfare of fish, as well as, you know, there's a lot of conservation regulations that have come into play. So um, there's not a lot of waste happening in the fishery sector. The one thing that we did find that's somewhat significant is um, brown crab waste. So we claw a lot of the crabs, so we eat the claws, but we, it's not usually worth eating the, the, the meat in the body of the crab. So those get discarded and that's that's where most of the fish, uh, most of the waste in, in the fisheries took place. Um, yeah, so I will move on maybe to some of the reasons. Um, so um, like I said, apart from quantifying it, we've, we've looked at the reasons. So in animal husbandry, um, it's, fairly straightforward with most of the animals it's either like diseases or, or animals getting injured and then dying um, um, but that's you know it, it's fairly under control but that's the majority of the reasons that we saw fall under that category and um, but with horticulture it's appears to be a lot more complex it might not be but um but the reasons that we've identified can be broken down um as you can see in the pie chart over there um so there's there's two main perspectives that we identified um and one of them is that a lot of the farmers or growers might complain that um you know they um a lot of the a lot of there's a lot of restrictions or a lot of um, decisions that are being made not by themselves but by the um, by the retailers um, or or processors. So the retailers or processors, there's certain unfair trading practices that can happen. Um, so they they can cancel orders at the last minute if a crop isn't selling very well or if they decide to put something some similar crop on order, then they won't buy as much of the other one on offer. Sorry, then they won't buy as much um, of of another vegetable. So they can you know they can order tons of a crop and then cancel it um, and then so that's 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 an unfair trading practice that could be avoided and they also have quite strict specification and um, specifications that they require for vegetables so um, you can see the not saleable part of the um, of the pie chart there that kind of dark wine red color is um, that's basically crops that are out of spec so they're either too small or too large or slightly damaged but all perfectly edible and that accounts to about a third of all the food loss and waste that's happening in the largest um, sector of food loss and waste that we can see so that's pretty significant. Um, so that's one side of it, um, but the other perspective of that is that the growers and the farmers and growers aren't necessarily doing enough. Um, so their their um, farming practices can you know they're not necessarily working with nature very well by using you know integrated integrated pest management and just more holistic farming methods in general, um, crop rotations, cover cropping, these kinds of things. Um, so a lot of the growers might argue that with the current prices that they're given for food, that they just can't they can't afford to to change the the process that they. Have have going on right now and um, so that's obviously debatable as well but there's things that can be done to to encourage those kinds of changes 
Um, move on from that. Um, so, like I said, this was all interview based. All the information was interview based. Well, not all. There's most of it. Um, there was very little that was real data. So, there is a lot more work that can be done to actually properly quantify all of this. But we do have a good picture. The main data gap I will talk about is that on pollution and climate change. Um, so, if you think about areas that used to be fished that are no longer um, that used to be fished that are no longer habitable because of fertilizer runoff, these kinds of things, there's there's a huge amount of food waste there that we definitely during this project we haven't been able to quantify, but some research might some research in the future might be able to tell us that um, and monitor that um, a bit better as well. And same with sea temperatures rising, you know, making certain biological issues worse as well. And um, so there's there's definitely some some issues there that maybe um, we can discuss a bit further later on. Um, moving on to uh, the solutions or maybe recommendations. Um, so some of the, so uh, my colleague, especially Tracy O'Connor would have kind of done a good literature search and also combined the solutions that we would have got from the industry stakeholders, the representatives and the growers and farmers themselves. We compiled um, a huge list of solutions to all the problems that we identified and then kind of filtered the, those down to the main goals, short term solutions, medium and long term solutions as well. But um, those can be distilled down into six main goals that I'll just briefly run through now. Um, so the first is the widespread adoption of low food loss and waste practices. So these are things that we already do. We already do very well. Um, but we can just ensure that they are being done completely across the country and uh, things like crop rotation, things that we know already practically and just, um, just giving those another final push. Um, so the next is improving production and uh, food redistribution infrastructure. So when we mean production kind of infrastructure, things like cover cropping, um, incentivizing those or, or aiding those somehow, or you know more, um, I suppose, knowledge exchange on doing that. Um, and then with food redistribution, so this would be something like food donations. Um, so food donations are, um, it's actually quite difficult for a farmer to donate their food. The infrastructure isn't there. They might not have the labor to, um, to harvest that food if they're not going to sell it. Um, and then to transport it to a centralized location to get that donated to people who might eat it. Um, that we're, we're actually doing a study on that at the moment with Food Cloud and we are finding that it is quite difficult to do. So there's, there's work to be done there. And the next is a total value chain stakeholder collaboration. Um, so this is basically commitments from everyone along the food supply chain. So the main thing here is to address things like um, unfair trading practices, as I, as I talked about before. Um, so, so just you know, um, regulating those a bit more than a bit better than they are being regulated now. Um, the next, which I think is actually the most important and something that I think isn't being talked about enough is in the value of short food supply chains. So short food supply chains are an example as a farmer's market. So um, instead of having that long supply chain where there's the food goes through many different steps before it um, arrives at the consumer, this is actually con connecting the producers and consumers. So just direct sales or as direct as possible sales between the um, the farmers and the consumers as well. So this encourages so much learning, collaboration, and communication. Um, it's you know it teaches people about um, what's you know what's in season at the time, what they should be buying, about the different sizes of vegetables, and it doesn't matter. And um, and also teaches the producers themselves about how to market themselves, what the market is like, so they can learn to make their own decisions and plan better based on what consumers actually want instead of what uh, maybe retailers are asking for. The next is to increase natu um, national food processing capacity. One thing that we found is that there isn't enough processing capacity in Ireland. So if you have a lot of surplus um, crop, then that might be easy to send to a processing facility. But if you have very little, or if you're in a very rural location, for example, it's it's quite difficult to do that. And um, so what we're suggesting is more localized and um, smaller food processing facilities. And um, so if there's any damaged or out of spec foods that can go straight there, be processed and stored and sold differently. Um, and then the last is producer resource sharing um, to support food loss and waste prevention. So this is things like forming trading cooperatives and having group certification. Essentially what this means is reducing the cost of growers to upgrades to more um, sustainable um, to more sustainable methods and um, yeah, allow them to, to reduce their food loss and waste with less risk and less costs. Um, and that's that's the end for me. I'll stop there now. Our report is coming out soon. We've just had our final um, sign off very recently. So the report should be released um, very soon. But in the meantime, if you have any questions, um, feel free to get in touch with me. My email address is there. Um, and yeah, that's all for me. Thank you very much.
Dr. Attard, thank you very much. That's absolutely fascinating. As you get more numbers there to back up the anecdotal evidence, it really does start to ask fairly fundamental questions about the sustainability of certain forms of uh, farming practice. Uh, before you go emailing your questions to Jennifer, though, please do get involved in our forum here. The Q&A tab at the top of your screen or to the side of your screen is where we're taking those questions. Go to it because it will also give you an opportunity to vote on other people's questions. It gives us, gives me a better idea of the things that you want answered uh, in the Q&A. So please do go and... Um, uh, submit a question to us there now, which we'll get to after our final two speakers. Uh, our, our next speaker is very interesting on a personal note because I have noted over the course of the last 10, 15 years how much of the really interesting, really exciting research in this area of the nexus of food production, farming uh, and environment has come from uh, the Wageningen University in uh, the Netherlands. And our next presentation is from the manager of the Circular Economy Program at that university. Uh, Twan Timmermans is going to talk to us about, um, well, it's going to offer us the opportunity to see how we measure up to everybody else uh, across Europe as his research has looked at food waste across a number of supply chains, not just in the Netherlands, but in a couple of other countries uh, across the, the European Union. Um, so this is the compare and contrast part of the conference. Good morning to you, Tuan. Thank you very much for joining us from Netherlands. Good morning, Philip, and thanks for the kind, uh, kind introduction. Um, Yes, and it's it's my pleasure to share some of the experience from across Europe and, and specifically the, Nether, the Netherlands. I see the slides. This is the last slide in my, in my show, so we have to click them back, see if I can do that. Uh, okay, now it's, it's probably going to work now. Yes. So I've been working uh, at Wageningen University and Research for about uh, 31 years uh, now and the last 20 years dedicated to uh, developing and supporting business, the business and society to become more sustainable. Uh, and food waste reduction has been the topic of my work and research uh, since, since the early, uh, early 2000s. At the beginning, when I got engaged with this, this work, working with business and governments, uh, the reality was that uh, e economy and financial benefits were the key driver for businesses to start looking at food waste. What we found at that time, working with, with dozens of, of industries, is that even though the business case for reducing and preventing food waste were quite positive, uh, and, and we saw some studies that that could be in the area of 1 to 14. That was not a reason for companies to scale up uh, the solutions that were already uh, at, at, at place at that time. Being in that area for a while, I saw other drivers and other, other mot motivations coming on board, especially the env environmental side and the food security side. The topic of food waste definitely gained more attention uh, at, at the time that the SDGs were, uh, were set, uh, with SDG 12 uh, supporting a responsible food production and consumption system as, as a major driver. But of course, we all understand now, and the timing is quite rightly, as, as mentioned by, by Philip, that uh, after the corona crisis, the climate and biodiversity crisis is, is, is coming up at, at this stage. And we see the very strong links uh, from those crises to the, to the food system. Knowing that uh, about one third of greenhouse gas emissions is directly related to our food systems globally. Uh, and it's good to see that now the talk is expanding from carbon and carbon dioxide to also uh, the, the methane and other uh, greenhouse gas emissions that are directly related to the food system and have, have more impact on, on climate change uh, than, than only the carbon side. What of course is, is very vital and, and already expressed by, uh, by Odile and others in the, in the presentation is to base the efforts on, and, on, on good data. I had the privilege to start with the first pan-European program to get and to work on harmonized measurements and harmonized methodologies to uh, be able to not only get the insights on the level of food waste across Europe, but also work on harmonized methodologies to start measuring at the, the, the different sectors. The first time we presented this based on work with, with uh, uh, 
yeah, hundreds of researchers was in 2015, where we were uh, able to publish for the first time a pan-European uh, status of what's the levels of food waste across, across Europe. Uh, and these are still being used by the European Commission, though, on the other hand, we know that there is more granularity and more insight, but the, the size and the volumes are still in, the, in line with what, what, what we found at that, uh, that, that time. Aiming uh, and telling that there's about 88 million tons of food waste per year in EU 28, at that time EU 28, uh, equivalent of about 20% of, of production, uh, causing 6% direct of total greenhouse gas emissions. If you look at the distribution of, uh, of food waste across supply chain, you have to take bear in mind that the definition being used for this st study is is that food waste is, is edible and the inedible parts. And that's, and that's showing that the relatively large amount of households, 53% is caused by that, uh, since all the inedible parts are also incorporated in this, uh, this me measurement methodology. If you would exclude and focus on the edible parts, the contribution of households would be more in the range of about 35%. After that work, uh, we started the second uh, uh, European program, and I had also the privilege to coordinate a refresh program, and that was much more looking at, at the ways how can we set up collaborative agreements and, and, and national programs to support businesses and governments to work collaboratively on reducing food waste and preventing food waste. So in, in the refresh program, we identified the key steps for success, successful uh, public-private collaborations, and we were able to pilot those in five different countries, the Netherlands, Spain, Hungary, Germany, and China. Those were selected because of the different state of maturity, I would say, and the different type of cultures and, and types of, of, of models that stakeholders tend to work together in these, uh, these programs. The Netherlands at that time was already uh, seen as one of the more mature uh, uh, countries in working and, and, and having models of businesses working together with other organizations. In the second stage of my presentation, I will focus more on what has happened in uh, the Netherlands and what is the state of play with the national agreement. When I started to work on, on this topic in the early 2000s, we didn't have any baseline measurements. So the first thing when the government got involved, and it was around 2009, was to uh, find a good methodology and way to collect relevant data about the levels of food waste across our country. It took a while, so we first were, uh, published these data in 2012. But since then, we have used the same methodology to see uh, uh, the progress that we made in the, in, in the Netherlands. And if you look at those lines, uh, you might be a little bit disappointed because we didn't make a lot of progress. There were hundreds of initiatives and Several of those were quite successful, but bottom line, we didn't make any really significant change in the level of food waste that we had. And probably it's good to explain that we, you see two uh, lines on the slide, and that is based on the level of uncertainty that we have in our data. And that's mainly caused also being uh, in, in line with what is presented before, that's mainly due to the not knowing how much of food loss and food waste occurred at the primary sector uh, level. For all the other sectors, the, 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 this, yeah, the, the level of uncertainty is much lower. But of course, also the Netherlands committed to Sustainable Development Goal 12.3, aiming for a reduction of food waste uh, with 50% in 2030. But, and that's, I think, an important message after refresh, we found a new way to set up a new strategic agreement and that finally ended up with establishing a specific charity called uh, Food Waste Free United or Dutch Samatek Food Spilling as a new program and a new, I would say, negotiated agreements with the businesses in the lead and the government supporting uh, the, 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 achieve, the, yeah, the target on how to achieve 50% reduction of food waste in 2030. And the positive side is that after we started also with consumer activation, we see that the most progress is made at consumer level. Food waste levels of consumers have been about 50, 
48 kilograms per, per person per year for a long time, and we see them going down. And I think one of the success factors is, uh, maybe it's good to tell, uh, to, to, to identify two. One is that we changed fully our approach to a positive social norm campaign. Uh, so making it a positive and, and really helping consumers by to, to take interventions. And the second, maybe equally important, is that companies are more uh, trying to, for example, change the portion size, that it is for consumers more easy to uh, reduce their food waste. These are two essential components for success, and we see the progress being made. But on the other hand, I think it's important to see that if consumers waste less, they are buying less. And that also has a consequence for businesses and brand owners to start changing their strategies also. And that's what's happened next. What is key in the approach? It is, it, it's a collective approach. And our role as Food Waste Free United is to connect and accelerate. So bringing the business together, have, having them in what we call the target measure act approach, what is universal and also promoted by the Champions 12.3, coalition, but we actually see that it is a model that works quite well. With having some basic, basic rules, uh, prevention always is better than uh, uh, if, if it cannot be prevented, make sure that it will go as food to people, otherwise to animal feed to keep it in the food supply chain, high value chemicals and biomaterials, and all the other things are not non-relevant because they still will fall under the definition of food waste. Based on the uh, the measurement and the, and the data, our aim and our target, and that's really concrete, is, is 1 million tons. So everything we do and focus on is identified as a solution that will bring us further to achieving this 1 million tons reduction target in 2030. We have identified as, as comparable, probably a, a, a set of roadmaps on the different sectors on how to achieve collectively, this 1 million tons. By having a systemic approach, and the systemic approach, I won't highlight that too much because it has been mentioned, is of course about trans transparency and having a good way to measure the levels of food waste across the industry and, uh, and uh, different, different partners. The second is on innovation and collaboration, mostly at supply chain level. The third one is on focusing to uh, activate consumer by creating a positive social norm that wasting uh, will uh, is, is no, no, lo no longer needed. And the fourth one, and that's an element that we added to the approach that has been developed in other countries, is changing the rules of the game. That has to do with practices of how companies will work together, but also to remove legislative barriers and to uh, get incentives for every company to follow the circular economy principles. And that is probably the most relevant thing for long-term impact to make it sustainable, to make it systemic, that we included that also as an element to our approach. Oh, I see I lost my connection with the Slido. Yes, it's working again, sorry. Um, we are a growing community and all these businesses that connect to us uh, in this what we call negotiated agreement uh, and signatories are uh, is, is a growing group at the moment we are with 100 uh, businesses that support and are signatory to to this uh, national coalition uh, you might not recognize many of these brands because they are all typic typically dutch uh, dutch businesses but some of them are of course also international like unilever and and, and some of the others what I think is it's important that this is an ecosystem approach. So we have startups, mostly scale-ups, SMEs, big corporates across the different lines of supply chains, um, from seed uh, producing companies up to waste management. And these are all front runners. All the businesses report to us, we validate their data. And of course, we mostly work with them on see how, what is the type of level of actions they can do as a cluster or by themselves or in their supply chain to meet those, uh, those targets. So the focus is much more, much on the action side. For some reason, the clicker is yes. 
what has been essential, and Odile already uh, shared the insights and the learnings from, from Ireland, is not only that companies report to us, but to create a norm, the benchmark. So we published in 2020, uh, the first time, the benchmark for retail. Comparable to an island uh, in the Netherlands, 1.7% of the food that goes through retail business is being lost or wasted. Um, and in the granularity of the data, you see where the product categories are and the reasons why these products are being wasted. This has been so essential uh, based on 80% of, of retail data that now, because we do this annually, the next data will be published uh, next, next month. So we see that retailers are now taking this benchmark and their targets more seriously. And some already identified like we can go faster than just this 2030 target. So uh, some of the retailers said we can do this in three or four years to half our food waste. And they're actually delivering on that. But what's also crucial is that, for, and, and we'll take out as an example, the bread uh, category, that is typically an outlier, that typically in the Netherlands situation, 7.7% of all the bread that, that's going into retail is being returned. It's mostly being used as animal feed again, so it's not wasted, but still 7.7% is very large proportion and, and uh, non-comparable with other fresh products. So as a consequence, now the bread sector has taken up the opportunity to start doing the measurement also. So next week, we will publish the benchmark for the, for the industrial bakers supplying to retail based on data, validated data of 30 of the 40 uh, businesses in the, in the Netherlands. So we see that model. It works also to, uh, you could say, push, but also invite other sectors to start being transparent also. But the focus there mostly, of course, on what are the type of solutions we can scale fitting to the strategy of our business. And that's what's been happening now in retail. Dozens of solutions are being identified, are being scaled, and are being brought uh, to, to, to implementation. And then the new range, based on the roadmap of, of solutions, are being looked at more on the supply chain side and what can retailers do to reduce food waste on the consumption side. As a next step, of course, it's working with specific sectors, for example, with the bread sector. So these are the data on the bread sector that we had collectively uh, already collected before the self-reporting mechanism was being, uh, being started up. Uh, but of course, based on the self-reporting mechanism, we will get more granularity on the data. But you see that on average, 20% uh, of total bread production in the Netherlands is not being consumed directly. Uh, half of it at consumer side, but also to a large extent at what's happening at the retail side and being returned end of the day. Based on this data, the sector is now working the individual business with their supply chain on typical solutions to reduce the amount of food waste in the bread category, mostly focused on the prevention side. Because on the valorization side, not so much can be gained because the valorization is already taking place since most of the bread from supermarkets is going to, uh, to, to animal feed already. But on the consumer side, it is mostly wasted. And that's what I think it's so relevant that as part of our activation program, we also work with, uh, with a very strong uh, consumer engagement and activation program. Uh, based on collective messaging, but based also on partners working in partnership with all of the businesses. One of the things we do, and we organize this for the second time this year, is organized a week, what we call the uh, Food Waste Free Week, and invite all partners, and that's signatories or other, on a voluntary base, to engage in such uh, activation campaigns and help consumers in a positive way to change their behavior and implement interventions they can do themselves based on nudging, based on toolkits that they can use, based on measurement cups and, uh, and, and what have you on type of solutions. So last, uh, last year, it's just a month ago, we organized the second version and I would like to share a short video to give an idea on how that week uh, and some of the highlights and how that week uh, ran for, uh, uh, in September this year. So if you could please start the video. En hopelijk doet u ook mee aan de Verspillingsvrije Week 
en inspireren we elkaar om goed met ons voedsel om te gaan. Maar bananen die zou je normaal misschien thuis weggooien, maar daar kun je echt zoveel lekkere dingen doen, mee doen. Plannen, maak een boodschappenlijstje. Het scheelt een hoop dat je gewoon alleen maar dat koopt waarvan je zeker weet dat je het nodig hebt. So I hope you get a good insight of what's happening currently in the Netherlands. Um, and what you see now is that sector by sector product case by product case, we're getting into this delivery of the roadmap of reducing food waste across the full supply chain. Um, engage people, engage with consumers. That's the way to do it in a positive, uh, positive norm. Um, of course, we haven't achieved our target yet, but we expect that figures in the Netherlands must go down. Uh, and they will go down because of the commitment of all the industry partners that they actually see now what it brings to them in reducing their food waste for their own business, but also for, uh, for the societal contribution they can make on, on climate change, biodiversity loss, and also food security. Um, and once these businesses see the benefits, they will take the further steps and they will also go to the more complex issue like what's the barrier legislation, what can we do in making agreements across the supply chain with our suppliers, for example. And that's what I'm really excited about as a next step. The quick wins, everybody can take them once they're engaged, but now we're getting to like, can we really deliver one of, as one of the first countries in, in the world uh, the 50% reduction target? Thanks for your attention. Tuan, thank you very much for that. I see I'm going to have to withdraw my racial slur about the, uh, the nature of Irish food waste, that um, the Dutch waste, it would seem, even less beer and wine than we do. Um, <laughs> what is reassuring on two different counts from uh, what Tuan just said to us there is that the Dutch are finding food waste as tough a nut to crack as we are here, but also that you have managed, particularly in the area of consumer practice, to bring about so much changed behaviour in such a relatively short space of time. We'll talk to you a little bit more about that later on. If you all please continue to get those questions into us in the Q&A tab uh, at the top of your screen. Um, I want to introduce our next speaker now, Martin Hoffler, because uh, Origin Green Board Bia 
have in recent times done quite a bit of work gathering and analysing the best and the worst of sustainable and unsustainable practices. And this work, this research piece, has informed their Global Sustainability Insights Programme, which Martin Hoffler from Board B is Sustainable Part, who is uh, Board B is Sustainable Partnership and Development Manager, is going to take us through now. Martin, good morning. Good morning, Philip, and thank you. Uh, good morning also to the viewers. It is a pleasure to be invited to speak at the EPA Food Waste Forum and to share with you Borbia's recent global food sustainability research. In the first half of 2021, Borbia conducted global research to better understand global sustainability demands around food and drink. The insights are designed to help understand customer and consumer behaviours and demands around sustainability. This is one of the largest and most ambitious pieces of research which Borbia and Orange Green has ever commissioned. In this presentation, I will first detail advances in sustainability trends within the broader food and drink industry, and then delve into the results as they relate to food waste. This research set out to uncover the sustainability outlook from the perspective of three groups of stakeholders. The first stage was our materiality assessment, which audited over 60 published pieces on agri-food sustainability and interviewed Borbia stakeholders and thought leaders to understand the global conversation and the conversation closer to home around sustainability in the industry. We then looked at the sustainability agenda for industry by interviewing trade buyers and sustainability leads for major food and beverage companies across nine markets. Finally, we interviewed through an online survey over 11,000 consumers across 13 global priority markets for Irish food and drink. Based on the initial audit of Agri-Food Sustainability Publication, a list of 25 sustainability factors for the food and drink industry in Ireland was developed. For this, we took a broad holistic view of sustainability, comprising of environmental, economic and social pillars, something that the biggest organizations are doing if you review their sustainability strategies. But this is by no means an exhaustive list. The reality is that sustainability is a difficult topic to communicate precisely because it encapsulates so much. Breaking it down into these topics and activities can make it easier to understand the sustainability benefit that the industry here can provide. These top topics were put to the top leaders, the customers, and the consumers to determine the priority place on each one by these different actors. I think a foundational insight of this work is that there is strong and consistent evidence that the agenda around sustainability has accelerated over the last five years and will continue to do so. The top level findings of the research has shown that sustainability is of ever growing importance for customers and consumers. No longer is sustainability seen as a niche factor when making purchasing decisions for buyers or consumers. This is specifically true for consumers as over the past year, 75% of consumers have made a conscious effort to purchase more sustainably. And looking to the future, 61% say it will become more important to them to buy more sustainably produced food and drink in the next three years. And while they feel the onus of pressure to make food and drink more sustainable is placed on food producers, consumers are willing to play their part. Almost three in four consumers say they are willing to make the changes to their own lifestyle to become more sustainable. And this is important to keep in mind when we discuss food rights later in the presentation. Despite an overwhelming agreement that the food sustainability landscape has accelerated over the last five years and will continue to do so, we are seeing a clear adoption hierarchy emerge amongst NGOs, consumers and industry. To help us understand this complexity, we can use a classic adoption curve, going from less mature approaches around sustainability at the bottom to mature, complex integration at the top. What we are seeing from the research is that some actors are further up the adoption curve than others but all groups are tending to all take the same direction of travel, with those ahead in terms of adoption, influencing those behind to move up the curve. At the bottom, we have the agenda setters that lead the way. Or at the top, apologies, we have the agenda setters that lead the way. Agenda setters are comprised of think tanks, NGOs, and sustainability leads within global organizations. In terms of the sustainability topics, they struggle to prioritize individual issues as they look more holistically at the landscape, referencing interdependencies, food system approaches, and interconnection of sustainability and nutrition. Behind them are the adopters, the sustainability leads who are growing in influence, 
ESG, investment values, and the media. They, in turn, are influencing the followers, which includes buyers and consumers. They are, then there are laggards who are less likely to embrace sustainability now, but are expected to move up the curve in the future. And there's clear evidence of two spheres of sustainability talk forming. The agenda sphere is looking for a discussion around big environmental issues like biodiversity, greenhouse gas emissions, water quality, and regenerative agriculture, as well as looking at future enablers of sustainable food system, like circular economy, traceability, and increased data transparency. The other sphere, primarily composed of buyers and consumers, are more consumer facing and driven by the consumption context. These sustainability areas are tangible and accessible sustainability factors that have a positive impact on the consumer more directly. By that, I'm referring to topics like food quality and safety, nutrition or natural food, and importantly, food waste. When we plotted the key sustainability topics out qualitatively, according to the sustainability context, on the y-axis, you see the agenda context driven by top leaders and in-company sustainability leads. And on the x-axis, you see the consumption context driven by the consumer and trade buyers. The environment and planet issues, such as emissions, waters, biodiversity, in the top left are primarily a concern for the agenda setters. For agenda setters, leading in and highlighting these big picture issues will be seen as taking a progressive role in tackling sustainability. Now in the bottom right, you see the three issue groupings that stand out for the consumption context. These topics are more tangible and more directly have a positive impact on the consumer like food quality and safety and natural food. In this graphic, food waste sits in this area under local wastes, with it being more on the agenda for consumers and trade as a result than for agenda setters. But, confer, but for consumers, it's a hugely important topic. It is clear that sustainability is more front of mind for consumers, as the vast majority of consumers surveyed are expressing a clear desire to be more sustainable, which is impacting the food and drink they buy. Now, almost nine in 10 say they have made an effort to reduce food waste in the last year. Just over three in four have tried to reduce packaging. And 65% say they're trying to buy higher welfare meat. This indicates how much sustainability is on the radar for shoppers and how a majority believe it will become more important during why it needs to be at the core of the industry's thinking. But when consumers aspire to act more sustainably, how does this tra transcend to how they make purchasing decisions? based on the size sustainability criteria of the products. We see here that some of the biggest consumers' influences of grocery choices are about the product. The product's quality, its naturalness. While many might not necessarily associate these with sustainability per se, but in some markets they are closely associated. If we look at more obvious sustainability topics, consumers are putting a big emphasis on packaging and food waste. Consumers appear to have a heightened awareness of waste they throw away. So packaging and food waste are front of mind. The naturalness of a product is also in this space, something we know is important for shoppers since the COVID outbreak. As the sustainability conversation matures and we see eco scores appearing, sustainability will become more important when consumers are making a choice in store. For food and drink companies, retailers and food service, the research shows that food waste is becoming a top priority because it's a top consumer priority. It spikes in importance for food service who have to do the act of throwing the waste out. It is equally important when choosing a supplier that they are minimizing food waste in their supply chain. So it's essential for any suppliers into these channels to be able to credibly demonstrate and communicate their food waste efforts. From the companies that engaged, we saw efforts and targets for reducing food waste in all retailer sustainability plants. As one example, Kroger in the US are prioritizing their zero hunger, zero waste policy, which plans to eliminate food waste in their stores and hunger in the areas in which their stores operate. While this does not incorporate the full supply chain, we may see in the coming years efforts from trade to investigate the full supply chain, essentially scope three for food waste. For example, Tesco has said by 2030, they will have a food waste targets for their own and suppliers operations. Efforts to tackle food waste often start with partnerships with, with food redistribution organizations like Too Good To Go in the UK and Food Cloud here in Ireland. It's important to note, so far we've presented global research, but the role of sustainability is different depending on the market and the context. Countries are at a different point on their sustainability journey. Let's then take a look at Ireland. 
This graph here displays what are the attributes shoppers, consumers care most about in Ireland. To the right are the attributes more influential on growth for choice. And bottom to top, the attributes are more associated with sustainability overall. On this graph, we can see clearly how important food waste is for the Irish consumer, and with it being one of the most influential sustainability attributes and associated closely with sustainability overall. Therefore, helping consumers in Ireland reduce their food waste is a great way for organizations to communicate a brand's care for sustainability. Also, it's integral for organizations to undertake efforts to reduce food waste in the supply chain. From Borbia's experience in the Origin Green program, awareness and action on food waste has continued to grow significantly as the last full reporting year, companies set standalone food waste targets of about 31. There is, however, scope for increased uptake in byproduct reuse innovation targets most importantly when the horticulture sector, as noted earlier. And this ties in with wider efforts to increase the circularity of the Irish food and drink sector. Through Origin Green, Borbia will continue to emphasize to members to utilize the EPA Stop Food Waste tools and supports, such as the Retail Food Charter and the new Food Service and Manufacturing Calculation tool. Collaboration across multiple government agencies, industry and NGO partners will be needed if SDG goal 12.3 is to be achieved. Today, due to the limited time, I've only presented uh, a snapshot of the Global Sustainability Insights uh, results. To delve into the results in the Global Sustainability Insights in far greater detail, please visit uh, the URL listed below. Here you will find in-depth look at the Sustainability Insights per market, per sector, and key insights into what regenerative agriculture, circular economy, and many more key sustainability topics mean for agenda setter, industry, and consumers. To end, I'd like to reiterate that globally and especially Irish consumers appear to be looking for greater information around key sustainability issues. Food waste is a definite example of this, but in terms of how food waste is avoided in production and but also how consumers can do more to avoid wasting food. It is also highlighted that consumers are looking for both information and leadership from food producers. Therefore, I would highly encourage food manufacturers and retailers to avail of both the tools and services offered by the EPA Stop Food Waste team as this will not only improve the sustainability of their operations, but also meet your consumer needs. So now I'll just hand back over to Philip and thanks, thank you again to the EPA for inviting me here to speak today. Handing back to me, but staying with us and also rejoining us, Dr. Attar, Dr. Timmermans and Odile LeBlanc as well. Before I come to them with your questions, I want to reintroduce the polls that we asked or set at the very, very outset. The very first question that we asked, and I accept that it wasn't pertinent to all of you, but hopefully those here from industry uh, will have answered that question, was how many of you are measure, measuring your food waste by weight? And oh, look, almost fully uh, four-fifths of us are, uh, and just 21% are not. Um, the other question that we asked, and this was really, really fascinating answer here, because I thought that if anything, it was going to be cost saving or regulatory pressures that would be at the top of your list of concerns, but no, and thank you very much for being so honest about it. Uh, I didn't think that many of you would admit to trying to gain reputational advantage through reduction of food waste, but there you go. Fully 60% put that as one of the top two motivators. And regulatory pressures, which I again would have assumed was going to be number one, is actually the thing that you are least concerned about. So either you are abreast of all the regulation that's coming down the track, or you're not aware of all of the regulation that's necessarily coming down the track. And let's um, now deal with your questions. And the first one of them, Odile, my God, a question you've answered a fair few times in your career. Audrey O'Shea says, uh, can we please have a specific definition of food waste? And when you think about what it is that Twan said earlier on about how edible and inedible are not always calculated in the same way, and if you take uh, inedible out, it really does alter the figures again, it is helpful to please say, what does the EPA count as food waste in Ireland? Yeah, and look, the EU have provided a definition of food waste, like what we have to measure is, is in a definition, but it's a bit of a roundabout definition in that it's, it's to do with what is food 
and then the definition of waste. So it's not clear cut, but what we do when we're doing our waste characterizations is when we're looking in bins and identifying food, we do try and categorize it into edible and inedible, at least that level of, of differentiation. But in fact, this is going back to the more granular studies. We're about to do a more detailed study on household food waste, where we will get down and dirty and is it cabbage, is it broccoli, is it edible, is it appealing, is it in its wrapping? And that's the level that we do need to start looking at. So we definitely need more information, but broadly we do split it into edible and inedible. Okay. Tuan, uh, on that and with the benefit of looking at as many different European countries as you have, is, is everybody um, in agreement on and following this EU definition of food waste or are you finding a little bit of difference from country to country? Um, one of my learnings when I started with the Fusion pro uh, Project, that's a commitment to the Commission, and I had put in it, we're going to propose a definition of food waste. That's the mistake I made. <laughs> because there will never be a universal definition of food waste. So what most countries do, and, and I agree with Odile saying, like, there is kind of agreement on what should be reported to the commission, but every country will like, make a transformation from the data they have and they believe in to the European de definition. And you also see it on a global scale. So there's the new report being published by WWF and Tesco uh, this year, looking at a whole different perspective, for example, on uh, uh, agriculture food loss and waste, also including pre-harvest losses. And if you include that, then the figure of one third that's being referenced many times, it could be even way more than that. Um, so what are we aiming for? Are we aiming for having sufficient insights from industry at country level to ident and stop, st stop talking about definition and go into action? Or can we continue for many years, depending on whatever driver and motivation there is, to make the problem bigger or smaller? Because that's what's happening, basically, by changing definitions. But we won't change the problem. Okay, exactly. It really does sound unhelpful that there isn't a universally agreed definition. But does it really matter, Odile, or does what ma actually matter is that we just get on with reducing it? I, I think this is, you know, it's, it, it's a little bit like as well, how, have we got data? How do we know where our target is? But we don't have time to be getting sure that it's 100% accurate. We need to take action. And it's quite clear we know what actions need to happen. We see the Netherlands are doing similar actions. Other countries are doing it. So I think it's a bit of both. You kind of need to obviously look at the definition and the data but we need to do stuff as well. Otherwise, we will still be here in 10 years' time. Connor Walsh asks a question in pretty much the same area. Does the EPA differentiate between wasted food and food waste? We have kind of addressed that. But Jennifer, I might ask you to pick up on something that's reflected in that question that you reflected in your research. Why did you include loss as opposed to waste when you were making your calculations? Because if, if a herd is culled out because they get tuberculosis, they were gone. They were never going to enter the food chain in the first place. So it's not food waste. Yep. Um, yeah, no, that, it, good question. And, and I think the way to address this is to think about why we're trying to reduce food waste, why food waste is a problem. Um, and one of the reasons is that it's a waste of resources. That's when, you know, we're using up land and water and, and many, many other things as well. Um, and so everything that goes into food that um, is waste food or whichever one you call it, but food that is ends up being inedible, such as um, from some kind of disease, um, that would have still used the same amount of resources. So that's worth preventing as well. That's worth working towards, it's worth measuring. Um, so I think those kinds of things should be included, and that's why, that's why I talked about them as well. And Martin, was there anything there, because it hasn't been published yet, that surprised you uh, and hasn't come up in your own research? Yeah, what surprised me was the levels of estimated food waste from the horticultural sector. Um, um, we use the definition that is used in the EU, the 2019, uh, and we've talked at length today about edible and inedible. But what's important within that definition they give is that they know that's very much culturally based to the, the definition of food waste. They're not eat, eat in some countries and others aren't. So that, that comes into a lot of the food uh, waste sectors when you look at animal proteins or the seafood sector. 
Um, some uh, seafood bodies would not see a fish head as edible, some cultures would. So it's how you differentiate between food waste. And it's a very important um, topic for a lot of food and drink manufacturers in Ireland to have that clear definition, because that definition then allows them to go to their senior manager to make those investments in saying, we need to invest X amount of money to reduce this portion of food, because this is classified as food waste. So before we have the reporting methodology, it's all clear that it's important that we have to have that definition. Okay, Look, while there might be cultural differences from country to country in what is and isn't food waste in people's minds, uh, Twan, I was very encouraged by and really interested in your positive social norm campaign and what it achieved. Have you any measurement yet on how much bang for your book you got? What, what did it cost and what were its results? Yeah, that's an interesting one. And there's, there's basically not so much evidence on, on this. The only that's been reported is from the Law Food Hate Waste campaign, early days from, uh, from RAP. But we found similar re results that for every euro invested, you would save about 200 euros of food, value of food, if you do it large scale. Wow. Just, just think of this and just... And we also did the calculation. What does it mean, for example, if you invest in this as climate change mitigation option? And then you would be up to two to three euro per ton carbon being saved. While current, what's on this table at, at the COP and at many countries, they talk about 50, 60 euros per ton. Seriously. And they are ignoring everything what, has, what can be done more easily uh, with food waste reduction across the food supply chain. So these figures may be not so well validated because there is not so much evidence, but they give a sign like we should prioritize more food waste, food systems as part of climate change and biodiversity uh, challenges because it could be way more cheaper than what's currently on the table. That's a very impressive figure, isn't it, Odile? Because typically we think of government and government agency information campaigns as being one of the worst way to change consumer behaviour. Have we similar research? Have we had similar look? We're, we're doing a piece of work on exactly that at the moment, this kind of evaluation piece of what we're doing. We are very mindful that obviously, yes, spending money on awareness campaigns is seen as ineffective, which is why we did our insights study and we're continuing we're updating that this year. It just makes sure that we're a lot more targeted. Like That small campaign that I mentioned about the young male climate change link for on social media, a very modest amount, like we're talking 150 euro, we actually reached about 100,000 people. And that did translate through to links onto Stop Food Waste website as well. So that kind of thing you can get a little bit savvy with. But obviously our survey also showed us that the more aware and the more you talk about food waste, the more people are conscious to change their behaviour. So it's not a wasted effort. It's just how you do it. And we definitely need to start quantifying in those ways as well. We move on to Mindy O'Brien's question. To gather data, it is essential to get this information from industry. Have they supplied this information willingly or is it difficult to obtain? I think when I first started looking at this sector, it was very, very notable how absent the retailers were and how, industry, how absent industries were as well. But increasingly over the course of the last seven, eight years, they are much more engaged. Yeah, I, I think what we learned with our work with the retailers is it wasn't readily available, that information. So it's not that they were just holding on to it, not wanting to share it. It was actually quite hard to convert what they're looking at in terms of stock, you know, into weight-based data. So some of them had to actually, you know, completely transform their reporting system. Others had it, they just needed to, to pull it together. And a bit like Twan said, obviously this is an annual reporting now, so once they get used to having pulled out the data, it becomes a more, and some of them do this anyway, it gets signed off in their annual accounts, you know. What we'd actually be looking for is it gets published and put in the public domain in individually. Industry, it's kind of the same challenge at the moment. We're used to reporting using this list of waste code, which is kind of a animal and vegetal matter is kind of the what, what the classification is. This is why we're looking at a protocol to start getting a bit more granular, similar to how we did it with the retailers. 
because that'll give the business insight and you know we're, we're kind of talking about the definition of food waste and food loss but ultimately for a business if there is food coming off their process line that isn't being sold you know that's a waste of money for them and they need to know about it fine if they can find a market for it that's great too but ultimately it helps give insight into the business on things that maybe need to change maybe an opportunity maybe there's a way to move it up the food waste hierarchy it might be going for anaerobic digestion now you could valorize it you know so there's all these different opportunities that that data will give you Tuan, let me get your input on this as well, please. Was it initially ignorance of how much they were wasting or a reluctance to admit how much they were wasting that characterised industry and retailers' approach to this? I think a combination of both. And, and to be honest, this has never been easy uh, because the first time you speak, it's also about building trust, building trust with the relation in the industry, but also building trust that the data are safe. You're not just going to publish them. It's all based on you're going to you are there to help us and you are there to help us but identify and look where the opportunities are, but also to help us as a sector. And I think that's why the insights of what is driving business as, as in your in your question question is like positioning. And that could be negative, could be positive. That is a key driver now for industry in the Netherlands to start reporting their data because they want to be prepared on what's happening or they want to take the opportunity when it is there. But it's, it, in general, I say it takes two to three years to get relevant data from a specific sector. You start with one of the two front runners. We do a mapping. So we identify and write down the process in the semantics they understand. They validate, see that it works, and then we enroll it across the whole sector. That seems to work for most of the sectors. And then after three years, you have good data, a benchmark, and the, and the, and the year after, the, the, the businesses are ready to, uh, to identify what is an intermediate target and a, re, a reasonable target that we can achieve. Like for the retail sector, that one of the retailers said, now we have the data, we have a grip on it, we know what is we can be done. We think we can reduce food waste with one third in one year. And they did it because it gave them confidence and on like, we can do this. And this, of course, gave thought to other retailers, like what if they, our competitor is going to do one third in one year, we should accelerate. So that's what's happening. So it's, it's, it, it helps to accelerate. Measurement is the first already intervention that businesses can take. And the quick wins, 25 to 30% reduction are always there, always. Martin, you're gathering just as much data in Origin Green as the EPA are. How freely, how transparently have you found it being shared? Yeah, so we, we engage quite regularly, myself and Odile and colleagues from NTU, on how we can best use the Origin Green data to inform um, new tools and methodologies developed by the EPA. Um, under the recent EPA's like, manufacturing tool, we have uh, informed companies, 15 companies, to take part in that so they can help best develop that tool going forward. I think um, what was stated there is that when we are working with companies, it's what they're looking for is supports and tools. If we set out saying we're going to release all data publicly at the start, you won't get that collaborative engagement. So it's a first building those measurement tools and those supports. So then when there is public reporting that companies feel confident about the data that they're sharing. We'll move on to Ruth Hegarty's question. She asks, while retail level food waste is not the biggest area, much food waste at primary production and consumer level is linked to retailer practices. How is this being addressed? Jennifer, in your research, anecdotally, what did you hear from farmers from primary producers about the number of times that food is sent back to them by retailers as being unacceptable for whatever reason? Yeah, um, so... Um, so like I showed in, in one of the graphs, it was about a third, I think, of, of, of the vegetables that were, uh, a third of the food waste was um, because it was unsaleable. So that's a third of, of the 20% the of food and that we would have seen. So that's, that's quite significant. That's about that's about 7% of all the food is is turned back. Um, so so that, that's the figure there. Yeah. It, it's quite contentious though because the primary producer wouldn't have sent it to the retailer if they didn't think that it was fit for consumption and obviously the retailer for whatever reason sent it back whose statistics should it properly belong in the retailers or the primary producers whose fault is it 
Well, I, yeah, I don't, I don't think I don't think it's about that. As one of the things is that it doesn't always get sent back. And um, it could just the farmers know a lot of the time that you know it's over on their spec and they won't send it in the first place. Um, but but it does happen, yes, that they get they get sent back as well. So there's there's a number of different reasons for why something wouldn't be um saleable. So I don't, I don't think it's about fault. I think because um, obviously as well the retailers are following the trends that they see consumers as well but they are increasing that by you know by <laughs> following that kind of a trend as well so um obviously i would see it as being more of a fault of the retailers but i don't think i don't think that's that's a very uh, kind of positive way to look at it or a helpful way to look at it i guess i think um what twan was saying earlier you know that more positive social norm campaign where people actually learn um the value of food and what they're doing and, and what food is um, you know whether it's over or under spec or what it looks like if people start making those choices differently as what um, Odile was saying a more targeted approach if we have a really direct message about the one thing that we really really want to say about food waste and um, which is you know that food is valuable that we shouldn't be wasting it and people just really put that value on food and stop thinking that oh this is just a euro and therefore I'm going to throw it away that's I think where our efforts should more be focused on as opposed to um Whose fault it is in this and that? I think I think there are solutions that um, that are implementable. And so often in what I do, Odile, I, again, it's anecdotal. Uh, I hear stories from farmers about having had agreements with retailers to take a crop that is then reneged on or changed or whatever, and the crop is left uh, rotting in the ground. And those figures end up going into the primary producer, into the farmer's column, rather than into the retailers. Do you get a sense of there being much of that, or is that more of an outlier? Um, we don't know, and that's why having studies like Jessite into it, because like you say, it's anecdotal until you actually see the, the trail of it. And in fact, some of the retailers are getting their suppliers to measure their food waste consistently as well. And all of this is helping to build up a picture. We also hear from the retailers when that consumers are demanding products in a particular way so you know there now you know there's an element of that where consumers are used to seeing pristine fruit and veg you know they don't see them with blemishes anymore so maybe that's why they don't want them but they have tried to do things like selling ugly fruit and veg you know and you know, there, there's a, how it's done might be you know not the optimum people don't choose them in the end so I think as consumers we have to accept ugly fruit and veg and also maybe uh, I know some uh, growers are also finding alternative markets for those kind of things so maybe lower grade things they might you know in particular one that comes to mind is the small baby potatoes that go you know they're they're sort of a, a whole new market that were developed from potatoes that were too small so. maybe the point of consumer resistance is the use of the word ugly that we should say <laughs> fruit with interesting personality <laughs> get better okay let's move on to <laughs> philip highland's question um would can I, the philip, e can I, can yes twan sorry because i i think it's uh, this is you're addressing a very important topic about supply chain collaboration We've seen the same in the Netherlands. And in 2018, we had a problem because of the dry summer. There were too many products that we were normally being dis re refused by retailers. Then it was in the news. And then the minister said like, yes, but we are all in this negotiated agreement. So she called me and said, you need to do something. So what we did is brought all the actors together and we set up round tables. And, we, and, and the minister said, we need to make a confident. One year later, the covenant was never signed, but all the retail practices and agreement have been changed. So it's now, all of the retailers are now in a full crop agreement. So whatever there is overproduction, different qualities, the retailer takes it as their responsibility to change, for example, the quality criteria. So the driver was, again, the positioning. And the minister said, you need to take action because it, you are in this negotiated agreement, that means you also need to deliver when things are complex. And, and, and I think at the, at the beginning, it was a lot of talking like, and the anecdotes, and we don't have data. And then it was like, yes, but are we going to do this or not? And, and they did it. Okay. The next question from Sharon Colgan actually comes to you as well, Twan. Uh, that Netherlands campaign focusing on behavioural norms um, or positive social norm campaign was how you referred to it. Can you share any learnings with us in terms of communications? What works, what doesn't, Sharon would like to know. Yeah, so like what doesn't work is being negative. So in our campaigns, you won't see any food waste. 
you only see solutions and you see the value of food. What also works, and I see that also with the approach you're following, do good, decent research on how to, and what are the best ways to, uh, to, to, to do the intervention. Is it on knowledge? Is it on behavior? Is it on attitude? Uh, that's very important. We did last year a study and, and an intervention on best before use by date. There we saw that there is still a knowledge gap between consumers to really clearly understand the difference. So that asked for a different approach than what we did this year on bread. So this year on bread, it was more a nudging campaign because 92% of, of consumers already had the intention to waste less bread. 91% knew what they had to do, but they just didn't do it all the time. So nudging was found more, far more effective as an intervention. And at the end, we just evaluated 40% of the consumers that actually saw the campaign actually did something in that week to change their practices. Uh, so if you do the good research, because if we would have been on the knowledge side on what can you do to reduce food, uh, food waste with bread, nobody probably have done the intervention. So good research on what is, what is the motivation, what can be done, what is the status of attitude and, 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 and uh, knowledge uh, is necessary to make up good interventions. And of course, we analyze them all the time. And all, all the time, what is the effect of the intervention? Because otherwise, you just don't know if you're on the right track and, and, and you learn from it all the time. Okay, one final very quick question, please, before we take a five-minute comfort break. Uh, and it's Audrey O'Shea's question. I'm going to put it to you, Martin. You might be able to give us insight here. She said that she was surprised by the large percentage contribution to food waste from process and manufacturing. I have to say, I was surprised uh, by that as well. When you consider how relatively easy it must be within the confines of one factory unit to get a handle or get a control on your food waste. Did that figure surprise you? That is a surprising figure for me. Um, the companies I interact with are very efficient. You do not see most waste on the floor. And in the waste figures that we've collected from them, they're quite low relating to food waste because there's ultimately an understanding within food waste manufacturers if you're wasting food, you're wasting money. So um, I'd be interested in engaging with NTU and understanding those figures in more detail. Okay. We're going to take a little bit of a break now. Um, thank you very much to everybody who contributed to that conversation. Some fascinating contributors coming up in the second half of this morning's session. I want, though, before I let you all go, to just point you in the direction, once again, please, of the poll tab. And we're going to ask you a question on what supports it is that you would like to see being introduced here. We're going to present it as a word cloud towards the end of today's session. And so I don't want to give you too many hints. I don't want to give you too many prompts that might end up influencing what it is that you're uh, in need of. But I suppose to give you some a general kind of indication of what it is that we're looking to see that uh, we might be able to better target assistance for you is do you want to see greater technological assistance? Do you want to see things like sectoral working groups? Would that be of any assistance to you? Or do you want to just see basic things like more assistance in getting your waste measured and how to target individual wastes and keep them out of the food waste or out of the whole waste system uh, in the first place? Anyway, do please go put your thoughts as briefly and as concisely as possibly into that and we'll present it as a word cloud later on in the uh, in the course of this morning's conversation. But right now, my thanks to Martin Hoffler, to Dr. Jennifer Attar, to Tuan Timmerman, and to Odile LeBlanc. We'll take five minutes and we'll come back to you then with another very, very interesting and impressive array of contributors and speakers. <laughs>